Welcome to Skip the Queue, a podcast for people working in or working with visitor attractions. I'm your host, Kelly Molson. In today's episode, I speak with Sandra Lyons Timbrell, Director of Visitor Experience at St Paul's Cathedral. Sandra shares an emotional recollection of starting a new role right at the start of the 2020 lockdown, and we discuss the unique perspective of St Paul's as a place of worship and also a tourist attraction. If you like what you hear, subscribe on all the usual channels by searching Skip the Queue. Sandra, it is so lovely to have you on the podcast today. Thank you for coming on. Thanks for having me. I've been a bit of a fan, so I'm quite chuffed to be here. To be honest. Oh, I love it when fans come on the podcast. I have to say, you look super fabulous today as well. Oh, thank you very much. As ever, we're going to start with our icebreaker questions. Okay. So I want to know, because this has happened to me, have you ever met anyone famous and lost your mind a tiny little bit? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, there's been a couple of people uh, and there was an international incident with Barack Obama, which will, which is a whole other podcast sub- subject. Oh. But uh, yeah, I suppose that Michael Palin was my big one because I, I think he's amazing. I love Monty Python and um, I just I had a bit of a thing for him when he was younger. I mean, obviously right. <laughs> not far now, you know, he's a bit older. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I met him a couple of times. But I met him at this book launch and I queued up for, for during my lunch break to go and see him. And I just got there and then just stood there as he was saying, hello, how are you? Thanks for coming. And I just went, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> just nothing. So yeah, and then I met him again and uh, he uh, w- asked again how I was. And I just said something really stupid, like, I'm getting married. And <laughs> I said, oh, that's lovely. Thank you. <laughs> so, oh, but that is yeah. lovely. You know, it is. But I, then I saw him again at another event and thought, I can't go anywhere near him. because he'll just be He would be like, oh, look, there comes that that crazy lady again. <laughs> yeah, <he laughs> What's she going to blurt out at me it. next time? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, working at the Globe, I met lots of famous people. And I have a really bad, because I'm really good with faces and terrible with names. So I used to meet lots of really famous people and then just say, oh, hi, how are you? And then realised they were, you know, like Gemma Arterton. Or- <laughs> I've done this on a train before. And because I always, because because I'm good with faces too. And I always think oh, I maybe I went to school with them or something. Yeah, you know, that I know them from the past. No, just the telly. <laughs> amazing thank you okay if you could um travel back in time what period would you, would you go to and Ooh. why well that's tough because I love history I'd be like Doctor Who in the TARDIS just dotting all over the place wow I don't know okay let's think about this I'd love to be around the Tudor court I think that would be really exciting I'd love to go to the restoration Charles II because I think I always imagine that was like a carry-on film because I think if you look at the picture <laughs> Charles II he looks like Sid James so I always imagine that like, after the austerity of the of the, the Puritan Commonwealth there would suddenly be this almost like you know Dorothy emerging into Oz and everyone's just having a really good time so I think the restoration court would be exciting and I'll tell you where else actually my my nana used to talk about the Blitz she had quite a good time she was in her late teens early 20s and obviously you know it was a it must have been difficult for her but she had a good time going dancing with GIs and you know she was in Trafalgar Square on VE day so something like that maybe joining my nana for a night out during the war oh that's nice isn't it yeah I love that <laughs> there you go <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, okay, and what is the worst job that you've ever had? Oh, gosh. Without a doubt, it has to have been, it was way back when, when I was trying to get into, into museums and I worked for an audio guy company who shall remain nameless, but I had to spend a week and a half stuffing envelopes for them. Um, and it was like proper nine to five, just stuffing envelopes. They were just launching their audio guide for the Bilbao Museum in in, uh, in Spain. And it was it was just soulless because I just sat in this room and no one came to talk to me. And I just stuffed envelopes for a week oh. and a half. And I thought, is this what museums are about? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's not the greatest, <laughs> not the greatest first yeah. experience, was it? No, not brilliant. No. <laughs> OK, well, and things have moved on quite Quite, quite well since then shall we say yeah, um, all right what is your unpopular opinion and then you can tell us all about your background oh my unpopular opinion you're going to get letters about this <laughs> I'm really sorry I don't understand why the great British Bake Off is so popular oh, I know so... I'm with you no it's okay oh, I'm yeah, with you I'm really... yeah it's all right oh I can't no me neither <laughs> Watch the complaints, Ron. Oh, God, um, they're going to come, aren't they? They they're are. Come. It, 
it's just I don't get watching people bake cakes I've tried watching it just doesn't make any sense and then I don't understand why people would want to enter a competition to make these big elaborate cakes when you could just go to the cake shop (laughs) buy one (laughs) I totally agree anyone else who does and I always feel like I'm saying something really awful when I say I I do think it was better when it was first on it was a bit of a novelty and I did kind of watch a few episodes then but I still didn't really I didn't love it I didn't get into it like I know people who have like bake-off parties and stuff yeah like they'll bake cakes especially for bake-off week and I'm like just yeah I used to work work with people say oh you know it's whatever week this week I was like "Mm." I'm going to go to Marks and Spencer and I'm going to buy some ready made cupcakes. And- I am all about convenience. Yes. And time and what your time, your valuable time that you need yeah. to spend on other things. And I'd oh. just be stressed. So we, we're going to get on, Sandra. We're <laughs> we definitely going to get are. on. Well, look, this all started with a little rubber, didn't it? My, yeah, my rubber collection. Rubber so collection. Um, for people that are, are watching, you can see here's my little, um, here is my little nice. uh, St. Paul's Cathedral rainbow rubber look at that mm. amazing now this was from a, my a 35 year old rubber collection and for our american mm. people that are listening i'm talking about <laughs> array, erasers novelty erasers but yeah like eight-year-old me used to have a, a, a big old collection and every time i went to an attraction a different attraction i would pick up a rubber so you know we have one here from 40 hall in enfield which is my Ooh. local local place I used to go to the National Gallery um, and I decided when I found all of these in my mum's loft um, a couple of months ago I decided I was going to get all of the people that I'd that, that could come on the podcast from the attractions and you're my first Yay. one Sandra I'm really Yay. so right. tell us a little bit about your your background yeah so I um I did a degree in ancient history and archaeology because I thought I was going to be um Indiana Jones and I was gonna you know find treasure and then I spent a lot of time in some very wet trenches <laughs> just outside of Manchester <laughs> living in Manchester and realized it probably wasn't quite as glamorous as I thought it was going to be um, and I really wanted to go into curatorial I didn't really quite know what and um, for various reasons I ended up um, in just after I finished my degree volunteering at the Verilanium Museum in St Albans and I originally went in to help the curatorial team. They were going through, they were closing for renovations. So I originally went in to help the curatorial team to pack up the accessions and items. But as time went on, I was there for a few weeks and I gradually got, so could you help an education team? Could you help the front of house team? Could you help with the group book? You know, all those kind of things were happening. And I remember as the placement was coming to an end, I sat down with the museum director and I said, you know what I've really enjoyed the most is the variety. And he said, ah, you're an operations person. And it was like this light bulb went off because I never knew. And I think, you know, that's part of a bigger conversation. I never knew there was such a thing as operations. You you get taught about the curatorial side, the conservation side, maybe the education side, but no one really talks about the the day-to-day running, the operational stuff. So I then went off and did a master's degree in heritage management. And at the end of that, I was really fortunate. I got a job at English Heritage uh, up at Kenwood House. And I stayed at English Heritage for seven years. I cut my teeth there. I had a really good time there. You know, it was it was hard work, but it was fun work. And we were all learning and, and moving at the same pace. Um, so I so was there for seven years. By the end of it, I um, was head of visitor operations for South London. So I had five beautiful historic properties and uh, public parks and gardens. Uh, I moved on to do a heritage lottery fund um, project management. And then from there, I went off to the Museum of London as deputy head of visitor operations. And that was just before London 2012. So the whole lens, the focus of the world was on London. It was such a wonderful museum to be at. And again, um, they were just opening the galleries of modern London there. So we had this amazing new team this amazing new gallery you know we were looking at fresh ways to engage our visitors uh, looking at fresh commercial ideas and again a really exciting time to to be part of the museum and that place will always hold a really special place in my heart um, and then moved on from there to Shakespeare's Globe where I set up the visitor experience um, department I went there as head of visitor experience and seven years later left as director and they, they, the Globe had grown quite organically. It, you know, it started as a, um, as a theatre, and then someone thought we'd better have a box office, and someone else thought well, we'd better have you know, a shop for people to buy things, and we should have some loose. It had been very organic. 
and no one has ever really been the champion of the visitor. So I came along to knit all of those kind of operational teams together. And then, yeah, so I got the role at St. Paul's and the idea was to leave the Globe on the 20th of March, 2020, and have a nice week off, go to a couple of exhibitions, spend some time with friends, my little boy, and then start this fantastic new job at St. Paul's on the 30th of March, 2020. Wow. Wow. So, <laughs> I mean, where do we start? Because because uh, that's a pretty spectacular time to start a new job. And that must have been quite challenging, just to say, <laughs> say the very least. Um, yeah. Can you take us back to then? Uh, can you share with us what it was like for you? Because I can only imagine what you were thinking. <laughs> yeah, it was the best of times and the worst of times, to, to quote Charles Dickens. It as I was leaving, there was this, I'll go back a bit a bit further, but there was this kind of infamous now, I think, meeting um, with the BE Forum. I know you've done a podcast on the BE Forum before. There was this infamous meeting at which a load of us were at Central London Attractions and Bernard Donoghue came in. And we'd been all been watching the news. It must have been like, you know, a bit about this time, mid-late February. And Bernard Donoghue came in and there was this thing happening in China. And he started talking about the impact that was beginning to have in Europe and also on hotel bookings in the UK. And as he was talking and he said the the words, a paraphrase, but it was along the lines of this will have a bigger impact or as big an impact as the Second World War had. And there was this palpable kind of intake, audible intake of breath across the room, because I think until that point, no one had ever realised just what this was going to be. And at the Globe, we talked about we might have to, you know, stop a show or not have a show. And I remember I went back, I went to St. Paul's on my way back home and I, I presented this to, to a couple of the team that I'd already met and said, look, this is what Bernard's saying. And it was like, OK, well, yeah, we'll, we'll probably need to think about if we can't do a service or if we have to close for a day or so. And I went back to the Globe and we're having the same conversation. Well, maybe it'd be a couple of days that we might have to close for. And then gradually, just as time went on and you just see these horrendous news reports and things creeping up, we started to have these, these bigger kind of meetings, you can the kind of, you know, the senior leadership team meetings that I was having just about financials, where we were, what the impact of this was going to be, how we were going to manage. It was before things like furlough and, and you know, the, the, all the grants that were there. It was this really stark reality that this was massive something was about to happen and we're all about to fall off the edge of the cliff and no one knew if there was going to be a net there for us no one knew what was going to happen next and that last week I was meant to leave the globe I meant to have the leaving deal on the Friday I just remember kind of from like the Tuesday onwards people saying I'm really sorry I'm not coming in for the rest of the week and I wish you were getting these emails until by the I think the Wednesday or the Thursday that I left there were four of us in and I had this moment, you know, I've been there seven years and it was just, well, thanks very much, you know, take your stuff and, and we'll see you when we see you. And, and I remember phoning St. Paul's and if you know the geography, the globe is just across the river from St. Paul's phoning up and saying, can I bring some things across? And the response was, there's no one there. We've all gone. We've, we've closed. So I had that week where I think I had coronavirus, but I was very, very sick. I don't know, but maybe at me about bed for the week and then I started on the 30th of March and you know day one is usually here's the photocopier you know here's your colleagues here's where to get a coffee day one was we are going into a restructure what do you want your department to look like and I hadn't spent any time with my team wow. I'd had like one coffee with a couple of them I knew nothing about the operations and yet I'm standing there or sitting there at my kitchen table rather having to make decisions that are going to impact people's lives people's livelihoods I I mean I can't I know I just I'm breathing out because I feel quite anxious even just hearing you say that but I can't imagine how well I can imagine how unbelievably stressful that situation would have been and how awful you know you don't know these people you haven't worked with them How, how do you even start to look at that With difficulty and with a lot of trust. And I think the other thing just to throw into the mix that my full time job, they then terminated my contract and gave me a contract for two days a week. So I was also looking at I might not have a job by the end of this Mm. and looking really coldly at what those um, I was almost looking at as a as a consultant in a way that I'm not really part of this organization that, you know, I'm I'm just going to have to look at this really objectively and see what I think. 
um, because otherwise I was just, and, and it was almost a good thing that I wasn't at the Globe and then getting tangled up in the emotion of that. It was, and I, I don't want this to sound cold, but it was almost better that I didn't know people because I was talking about job titles and job roles rather than yeah. people names. Yeah. But having said that, it it was really bloody tough. And it was this huge weight that I felt of responsibility about what I was doing and what I was shaping. But I had to put the trust in the team that were around me, who I have to say have been and were absolutely brilliant. I didn't get one person saying, what are you doing here? I didn't get one person, you know, everyone was there supporting me and saying, if you need anything, this is my phone number, give me a ring, you know, let's talk it through. So we lost 25% of the workforce, which was huge. Um, but I had to trust that when my teams were telling me that I needed this amount of FTEs to keep the cathedral floor open, that that's what they needed. Mm. I do remember sitting in several meetings and I had this PDF map that I picked up when I was doing the recce for the, for the role um, next to me because we were going into the granular detail of where these people would be and how that would affect the, the experience, whatever that experience may be. And they were talking about North Transept. I was going, like, hang on a second, North, where's that? North? And I'd look up and the conversation moved on. I was thinking, I don't know what you're talking I'd have to keep stopping and saying, where is that? What do you mean? So I had to trust that they were telling me the right things. Um, and for them, they had to trust me. And there was a lot of patience, I'd say a huge amount of patience for me to, to pick those things up, which, you know, in an ideal world, I would have done gradually over a period of time. Yeah, I guess, you know, it's such a difficult situation because like you say, I think the way that you approached it from a consultative perspective, I think that brilliant. I mean, that's the only way that you could have done it, isn't it? You know, to try and take the emotion out of, out of what was happening. But I think, you know, that must have been really difficult for you as a leader because you are in a position of leadership at that point and people are looking to you, yeah. regardless of how long you've been in that role, they're looking for you to, to tell them what they need to do or what's going to happen. And that must have been yeah. such a weight on your shoulders. It was a huge weight. And as I say, it was, I was only there two days a week. So I chose Mondays and Thursdays because they were when the senior leadership team were meeting. So I'd be from nine o'clock in the morning, Monday, back to back Zooms, trying to get to know people, trying to work out what the impact of saying yes to this and no to that was, trying to get, you know, under the skin of the finances, the operations, and then I'd be off Tuesday, Wednesday, and I'd be looking after my little boy and, and doing all the other things. And then Thursday would come along and I'd have a million emails and people, I'm really sorry, we've, we, we've changed that decision and you weren't part of that. And I'm really sorry you weren't part of that. So as a leader, I felt constantly on the back foot and I felt I always want to have the answers or if I don't have the answers, I want to say to my team, I'm going to find a way to give you the answers. I'm going to get back to you on that. And what was so difficult was not being able to do that. We were reacting, and it's not just St Paul's, it was across the organisation, we were reacting constantly to other people's decisions. And one of the things I had to say, and, and I don't think, and I've, I've, talked, I've spoken to other people, and I, I know I'm not the only one who, who has said this, there was a certain point where Boris was doing those super helpful press conferences at five o'clock every, every day, and there was a certain point where we had to shut down the idea that Boris gave us all a call just before he went on the TV to say what he was going to talk about. It was like, we are getting this information at the same time as you at five o'clock at night when we're all also exhausted from being on back-to-back -back Zoom calls all day. And then we're having to react to what we are being told. And in some instances, it was like, well, this will be happening in two weeks' time. In other instances, you know, this is happening tomorrow. So we then had to make very quick decisions off of the back of that. And working so reactively, firefighting in a way, it's so tough because you're not, you don't have that, that, that stepping back, that evaluation, what worked well, what didn't work well, how could we do it better next time? It's just, we're just going to have to go with this and keep going with this. Yeah. Yeah. And it's exhausting, isn't it? it and that, 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 that reactive nature was, yeah, like you say, absolutely knackering for people because, yeah. you know, you're all zoomed out and then you're having to make really strategic decisions based yeah. on information that's just been thrown at you that might suddenly yeah. come into act the next day. And so then those days get longer and longer and longer. Oh, yeah. what do you, from all of that, looking back though, what do you think are your biggest learnings that you took away from, from the situation? I think two. 
Um, the first one was was to be honest and that idea of honesty that I talked about, you know, saying to the team, I don't have the answers, I don't know, you know, making really clear that we were all, what's the phrase that you were all in the same boat and it might be, well, we're not, it was the same storm, but different boats. But the idea that we were, we were all going through this in some way, shape or form together and that there weren't answers. There wasn't a usual, this is our five-year plan and this is how we're going to get there. It was, it was just it goes back to that idea of trust but being honest that we were doing our best and we didn't know but we were trying to find out the answers or trying to do as much as we could to make it easier for the team yeah um and I think the other thing I've learned and I keep telling myself this is to be kind to myself because I started the first day of my job on the 30th of March a week into lockdown and I had to keep reminding myself that I didn't know I wasn't expected to know. And I've been there, to, it's coming up on two years, but I say to everybody, it feels like six months. This is the first time that I've seen any kind of normal cycle to the cathedral, that I've been in any kind of normal planning meetings, that we've been talking about the next five years as opposed to the next five minutes, the next five days. So I sometimes feel a bit of a fraud. I sat in a meeting the other day and I said, I'm really sorry, I don't know anything about this. And someone said, oh, you've been here two years. I was like, But this is the first time I've had this discussion. This is the first time this has ever been told to me as an operations manager. Um, And it's just reinforcing that. And as I say, being kind to myself that I I shouldn't have expected that I would have all of the answers because we were all navigating this pandemic together. None of us have been through it before. So why should I know what to do? Yeah, it's really interesting. And we don't, I don't think we're all kind enough to ourselves on a day to day basis anyway, let alone when there's a global (laughs) pandemic happening. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I had a really similar chat with my team a little while ago about, you know, how, you know, me and my co founder suddenly had to understand how to run a business in a completely different way. You know, completely, we'd never done, we we had one team member that that worked um, virtually for us or worked, you know, remotely for us, but we suddenly had to understand how we were going to run our whole business completely differently than we had before at a time where we weren't sure if we were ever going to win any more business ever again, or, (laughs) you know, if clients were going to stay with us, we just didn't have a clue what was going, but everybody was looking to us to tell them, you know, what was going to happen. And we were just like, (laughs) I've no idea. (laughs) That's the anyway. assumption. You were you were digital. You were going to come and save the world, weren't you? And That's apparently so. Yeah. And, <laughs> and and you know, touch wood, things were okay, and we got through mm. it. But we still didn't really have a clue. It was all just guesswork, you know. And and like you, we were reacting on information that we were hearing on the telly and going, okay, well, we oh we oh we can do that now. Then okay, well, we better do that. Oh, I'll get on. Oh, I'll ring up HMRC. I'll ring up the VAD <laughs> office. We'll just put everything on pause. Um, yeah, absolute chaos. But now we're in a very, very different place. It's incredible to think how far we've come. I was just going to say, I think if anyone had said, you'll still be here in two years' time, I think we all have just thrown ourselves in the tent, to be honest, wouldn't we? (laughs) But hey, we are where we are, you know. (laughs) Well, I'm just glad I get to go back into London and see the Thames. That's exciting. Um, So I I do want to talk to you about a very unique challenge that, that you that yeah. you have and I think it, what's really interesting is obviously you know we all know St Paul's it is it is I have such fond memories of St Paul's I think we spoke about this when we had a, a kind of pre-interview chat it's, it's one of my dad's favorite buildings and it is it is absolutely stunning I have such good memories of visiting it with him as a child and going up to the Whispering Gallery I can remember having a you know my rubber is not the only it's not the only thing that I have from uh, oh. St Paul's Cathedral. I, we had a beautiful puzzle. We used to do puzzles when we were kids. <laughs> That's a lockdown thing, isn't it? Um, but it was of the uh, the the dome of the Whispering Gallery, so the beautiful uh, the beautiful pattern. And um, it, it, you know, a lot of people see it as a tourist attraction, which yeah. is. Yeah. But it first is. and foremost, it's a place of worship, yeah. and so you know, I. I'm intrigued just to understand how you get that visitor experience right for two very for for two audiences that are coming for very very different reasons. Um, yeah. One to worship, one to look at the architecture, the for sightseeing. example. Yeah, and it is a really fine balance that we have to strike. And 
I think the thing, the thing that we have to think about is I, I come from a very commercial angle about if we keep the building open, then we allow worship to happen. And that's a really stark way of looking at things. And I have some cl- clerical colleagues who come from the other angle, which is this building is just here to worship. Mm. And we have to be very careful about what we do in order to raise the money. I think the first the first thing we all sign up to is that we are respectful of other people's opinions and other people's beliefs and other people's needs. Um, so there is a chapel that you can go into. So to come to worship, to come to pray, that will always be free at St. Paul's. And there's a chapel that you can come into and you set aside for private prayer and you just announce yourself and you can go straight through into that and you can pray or you can come along to one of the Eucharists or you can come along to one of the bigger services and you are you are there for free. There is no there is no assumption that you would you would pay any money. However, what we do find is that worship and tourism aren't mutually exclusive, and that's something that the dean and certainly the the, the more pastoral colleagues I have are really keen to to point out that you don't simply have to just be a tourist. You don't simply have to just be here to worship. You can come and worship and think, look at that amazing architecture. You can come as a tourist and think, actually, that's a really beautiful service, or I'd like to listen to the words that are being said. And as someone who isn't particularly religious, when you step into the space, you can appreciate the spirituality and the mindfulness of the building. It is an absolutely beautiful building, and there is a sense of still and calm when you go through I think it's in, lot, in, in many churches, I've been through a sense of still and calm, but you don't have to be there specifically to worship, to appreciate that you're in a place um, that is absolutely stunning and absolutely beautiful. You know, I've, I've seen some really amazing services now, you know, some of the Christmas, we had the consecration of bishops earlier this, um, this month, and they're absolutely joyous. And it's just amazing to see people just really enjoying being there and using the space, what it was intended for. The way that we look at things and the way that we market is that it's about the building. Yes, it's a place of faith, but it's also a place that's been at the heart of London, the heart of our nation for over a thousand years. Not the same building, but, you know, building in that place has been there for over thousands of years. And so it's part of our lives. It's part of our our collective memories of things like Charles and Diana's weddings or, you know, the, the Jubilee celebrations that we've got coming up. So when we are looking to market the church, we talk about it being alive with stories. We talk about hidden cathedral. So those places that you don't usually get to see on the tourist trail, but actually might also appeal to people who are worshippers as well. But there is a challenge. I mean, as a working church, we stop for Eucharist at 12.30 every day. We stop for prayers on the hour, every hour. We have some big services like, for example, the consecration of the bishops, which is, is not ticketed to the public. It's ticketed to the bishops who are being consecrated. So we have to close to the public. So we have those kind of challenges of, of how to work around that. We can't just simply say that we're open. We, you know, the, the, the website has got some very complicated, but not at this time, not at this time, messaging there. Um, but actually, again, that's part of the beauty of it. Why are we closed? This is why we're closed. This is what we're doing. This is what we're celebrating. So, yeah, I find the it's it's a challenge, but it's not as big a challenge, I think, as you would expect. Yeah. Does it does it bring any kind of advantages like or disadvantages with that as well? Or is that is it? I guess that's really what we've kind of spoken about in terms of the disadvantage of closing and <laughs> having to explain why why you're closed for certain things. Um, I think the advantages are learning about why why it's there, learning about what St Paul's is, and you know we you can get married there, people get married there, people have their children baptized there. Um, so when people find that out, they're like, oh, that's really interesting. That's really so. How do I do that? So again, it's just it, it's just opening up and unlocking those stories that I talk about, unlocking the building for people. Um, I suppose you know an, another kind of challenge is that we can't be. This is a nation's church. We are the place where the queen comes to worship. So what we can't do is we can't be provocative. We can't be aggressively commercial. We have to respect that this ultimately is a church. This ultimately is a place of worship. But the understanding also is there that we we need to be commercial in some way, shape or form. It costs eight million pounds to keep St Paul's Cathedral open every year. Gosh, so we need to raise that money 
So when, I, when I'm talking about driving visitor numbers up, when I'm talking about driving income, it's not to the detriment of the core values of what St Paul's Cathedral is. That value of faith comes first. Yeah, yeah. And it's a, yeah, it's like you say, it goes back to that. It's a very fine line, isn't it? To try and yeah. keep everybody happy and everyone considered in those circumstances. Mm. Look into the future, because um, we're all about future and positivity now. <laughs> Um, you've got the Platinum Jubilee exhibition yeah. opening. Is it we the 25th have, of May? 25th of May. Right, right too. Yeah. We have. So it's all about all of the Jubilees, that, all the Jubilee celebrations that we've had at St Paul's. So there are four of them which are celebrating George III, Victoria, uh, Edward, and uh, the Queen herself, who will be having, yeah, this is her fourth um, celebration. And I was in a really exciting multi agency Jubilee meeting the other day for the actual service. So that was lovely again to be part of, you know, seeing St Paul's opening up again and being part of these bigger services. But yeah, come along. It's going to be great. So, um, as part of our HLF funding, when just after we when we were in lockdown, I got an audience development plan um, pulled together, and what we found was before the lockdown, almost ninety percent of our audience were international tourists, and the remainder were domestics. But the reason the domestic market weren't coming were broadly because you know a bit like you, you came with your dad when you were at school, you went up to the Whistling Gallery. What's the reason for coming again? So part of the my engagement strategy is trying to put things into place which encourage people to come back to St Paul's and think of it a bit more of a a return visit so we've got kids go free happening this uh, half term we've got the jubilee exhibition going in this year which runs from the 25th of May all the way through hopefully into about Christmas and then we're looking ahead to Wren 300 next year which is going to be huge that's the 300th anniversary of Wren's death so again trying to think of some events that we can do on the cathedral floor. We've got our summer lates program, which I'm in talks with a, a brilliant uh, a, a company to do a partnership with some events with us. And maybe something a little bit more unexpected on the cathedral floor, but all bring it back to the idea of mindfulness about where we are. And, you know, we can't be too provocative. We can't be aggressively commercial, but actually let's look at St. Paul's in a different way. Let's look at the architecture, let's take our inspiration from, from the mosaics. The other wonderful things that we have there. So, so yeah, no, we're really looking forward to the Jubilee. It's, it's massive for us and everyone's super excited. We've got our guides who are, you know, doing new guided tours, um, pulling those together. We've got our VEA teams so are bringing some objects down to the cathedral floor for people to, um, for the, part of our handling collection. It's really something we're all putting together for. I think after the past couple of years, this is just the kind of the joy that we need. Oh, something. it just, yeah, it feels like a big celebration. It feels like yeah, it's it's it it's really well-timed, isn't it? Yeah. The, the Jubilee and it happened. I feel like it's going to bring everyone back together again. Um, I love the idea of, of, of the lates. I'm very excited yeah. and intrigued to find out what's happening <laughs> there. But you are right. It's been difficult, isn't it? You know, for attractions that are predominantly international tourists that come you know that must be really difficult for you and I think it's it's wonderful that you've now got this program where you're encouraging people to come back I'm definitely going to come back and, and come and see the exhibition I'm really I'm really excited to come and see that and I'm going to bring my daughter Yay. for the first bring time that might be her first little trip it. into London oh um, really exciting but yeah I just think it it is one of those places that you do go to as a child and there needs to be that continuation of why mm. you should come back so yeah, very excited yeah. to see. We just we just need to, you know, as I say, we're obviously restricted for many. We, we don't we don't have an outside space really. We can't just put exhibitions anywhere. We don't. We're not as we're not as we can't be as reactive as, as some um, can. We do what we can. Yeah, and do it beautifully as well. Oh, so I always ask our guests about a book that they love. Yeah. And um, now it's it can be something that you love from. It can be something that's inspired you in your career. It can be something that you love personally. What have you got to share with us today? I found this really tough, you know, because I read all the time. And so choosing one book, because I can't do that, I can't do that. Um, So I came up with a couple and then I had to pare it down. So I've got The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern, which is absolutely brilliant. And then Anything by David Mitchell. But I decided that the one I would tell people they had to read and if they could win it, they should, was Life After Life by Kate Atkinson. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I have not read, read this book, no. It's a story of a girl, Ursula, who is born in 1910, and it's the multitude of lives that she goes through. So every chapter, she has a different life. In the first chapter, 
she isn't born and it goes all the way through, goes through two world wars where things happen to her or don't happen to her. And she begins to have this memory of what her life was and she takes herself out of certain situations. And I just love it because it's this idea of, of it's almost like if you take a, if you take that turn, that doesn't happen, but something else happens. And it's a rich, she, Kate Atkinson writes absolutely beautifully. Um, so it's a really lovely book to read just to kind of think about, yeah, maybe if I'd opened that door, I would have been over here, but here I am. So. Oh, I like that. It's got, let, that's, that's arcing back a little bit to our little time traveling question that it you is asked at the beginning as well, isn't I it? I told you. Mm, like, the little trip like through, old stuff. travel through history. <laughs> Well, look, as ever, listeners, if you want to win um, Sandra's book, if you go over to our Twitter account and you retweet this podcast uh, announcement with the words, I want Sandra's book, then you will be in with a chance of winning it. It's been so lovely to have you on today. Thank you for sharing what I can imagine. I mean, I felt it while you were talking at a very emotional and very challenging time. And um, so I'm very grateful that you were open to to sharing that with us today but I'm really excited about what's coming next for St Paul's and I think that there's lots of good things to be really really positive about and um, I'm looking forward to coming to see them. Oh looking forward to seeing you yeah it's going to be an exciting summer we saw some international tourists yesterday so it's all going to be okay. They're back! <laughs> They're back! <laughs> the world is open! <laughs> it's all, all right. <laughs> Brilliant thanks so much Sandra. Thanks so much Kelly. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Skip the Queue. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a five-star review. It really helps others find us. And remember to follow us on Twitter for your chance to win the books that have been mentioned. Skip the Queue is brought to you by Rubber Cheese, a digital agency that builds remarkable systems and websites for attractions that helps them increase their visitor numbers. You can find show notes and transcriptions from this episode and more over on our website, rubbercheese.com forward slash podcast.